isn't it amazing that you can still live in the centre of a great city like Perth, still have natural systems? And that's a journey I think all of us do, and if you don't, you should do it a lot more. And it's certainly uplifting to finish the day uh, on that score. But my journeys have um, come in many different ways. Um, my great passion of orchids, and I promise there's only a small segment of orchids towards the end. Um, but being raised in Western Australia in the bush as a kid, I had the very, very great pri privilege of walking in bushland and finding kangaroo paws and all sorts of amazing things from the hobies that can flower now all the way through to myrtles and so on. And it was really an amazing opportunity for me living then in what was called Morley, that was called the bush area at that stage. Um, and amazing books like Rita Erickson, what, what a champion she was, same mould as George Seddon, great unsung hero, I think, of natural history, published many books. But this was the book that unashamedly as a child, I used to go to bed with this book. I don't know if it's deep, but all the until the rest of one of my favourite volumes. And, um, I used to pour over that and dream about finding many of those orchids because many of course the richest orchids areas were to the south and to the east and other areas difficult for um, a, a kid being raised in outer suburban Perth to get to. But this was the real crowning achievement was when um, in 1966 we went to decimal currency and, and I saw a five dollar note. I was still comparatively young at that stage and realised that there were things called botanist and botanical professions uh, that you could go into. And that's when I started seriously trying to work out what I was going to do and, um, and <coughs> visited UWA on one of my uh, school outings and realised that I could do botany and all the rest. What a tragedy with the new $5 note. Uh, have you seen the new one? Yeah. You know what those things are? They look like mitochondria. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the birds actually are the wrong colour as well. They're waffles and so on, so it's all lost the way. I don't think I would have become a botanist had I seen that kind of <laughs> But um, it, it was in those early formative days that I started to get a very clear understanding of some of the issues, but also witnessed um, the loss of so much of our bushland. And that then led me into a whole range of interesting and uh, side journeys in the pursuit of my botanical career. And that journey, I think, has been one that's encapsulated in, in this image here. This is um, Gondwana, as we see it. It's the fusion of the land masses. This is 250 million years ago. You can see we're all joined together. Remembering that the flowering plants, the things that we, we work so much on, um, didn't appear in the system until about 135 million years. So at this stage, this was a world dominated by the conifers and the cycads. And then the extraordinary thing started to happen at this point that these continents began to split apart and they, they were splitting apart at different rates and, and because of that different rate and if you have a look we approached the 135 million year mark very soon you can see we've already broken off from those northern areas but we were sharing the floras with those other southern continental partners they then glided off inseminated with that florist, you would have seen India roaring to the north, crossing the equatorial zone, which was essentially a great uh, climatic bulldozer that cleansed lots of the flora from that Gondwana and land mass, you'll see it roaring up again. Antarctica, of course, was forested, um, was covered in forests such as the Glossopteris that you see here. Um, Chill lost that flora, but Australia travelled on its own lonely journey north, carrying up with it a remarkable laboratory of the germplasm of an extraordinary flora um, into the future. Now, Australia is interesting, but um, because I'm speaking to a Western Australian audience, I can say this. I think Western Australia, of course, is the jewel of the Australian <laughs> crown in so many respects because it holds so many prizes for being the, the place of the richest and most diverse systems. If you look at this spot up here, many of you wouldn't have been there, it's called Jack Hills. If you've been up on Jack Hills, you would have seen rocks like this. And in those rocks, some years back, there were little laser holes. 
they drilled into those to find that these zircon crystals of 4.6 billion years old were the oldest examples that approximated the early crust of, Earth, of the Earth. And that's only in Western Australia, and that's at about that spot just there. If you go to a spot such as the North Pole that we have up in the Pilbara region, you can see real living examples, well, dead examples, but you can pick them up. Um, sorry, it is. Um, of a more recent journey, and this is, this is from about 3.85 billion years ago, this rock that I'm holding. This is, in fact, an ancient stromatolite from that area. This is an image of that stromatolite. We have living stromatolites today, undoubtedly different species of these strange cyanobacteria that made these rocks. But if you go to the nearby chirps around this uh, stromatolitic formation and section that rock, you will find evidence of some of the earliest life on Earth, again, here in Western Australia. Remarkable journeys. Now, one of the important things about Western Australia, and you'll see this term comes up, come, come up, and this is from the work that Steve Hopper um, did, and I apologise, the computer system's doing strange things, but the one great thing that uh, happened was that we had enormous stability on the western half of the continent for <coughs> periods of time unparalleled on Earth. That's why we have these old rocks sitting around on these landscapes. That's why if you go to a place uh, like the Kennedy Ranges here, um, and you dig through that uh, material, uh, the work that was done at the museum found this fossil some years back, Banksia archaea carpa, amazing fossil, um, which, if you look at it, is remarkably similar to this Banksia cone, which we have in Kings Park. This is the firewood Banksia, Banksia mezizii. And the, the intriguing <coughs> thing is, when you get the architecture right and, and the structural systems right, the valves here that protect the two seeds, the whole conflorescence that helps um, embalm the structure so it's resistant to fire, resistant to power attack and so on. Once you get it right and you've got a stable environment, you just hold on to that engineering solution. And that's exactly what's happened. The difference is we're talking here of 50 million years of crust. This is long <coughs> since extinct, but today you can still see that same engineering pattern working supremely. Go to a European forest, which is all post 16 million, uh, 16,000 years ago after the last place on that. There's lots of older species in there, and you'll find all of the engineering solutions there are all very contemporary for contemporary landscapes. So we've got these old landscapes that Steve Hopper worked on. Stay, it's great stability and protection of these sorts of systems. So what drove this amazing process, though, of diversification that we had in the southwest? Now, I borrowed from some satellite imagery, and although this is a typical year in Australia, essentially you need to think of this in geological time. And if you look at the southwest corner, you'll see what happens as you go into winter, then go into summer and winter. So this is just in the loop. The important thing to see here is that on this relatively flat landscape, the one and most important thing that happens is you go through wet periods and then you go through arid periods. Extend that out over the last 30 to 60 million years in the southwest, and you have potentially, <coughs> when you go through uh, major climatic epochs, you start getting major opportunities for speciation. And so what our flora did was it had to just cope with a stable old landscape of infertile soils, but it had to cope with drought and water availability. And it had to do that because if it didn't, it was very quickly made its end. And these periods of the drought sweeping through the southwest were, were probably major periods during climatic glacial maxima and minima that drove diversification in the southwest flora. But it didn't mean species went extinct and got brand new versions. We've seen Banks who got the story right and, and was retained in that southwest landscape um, and diversified to about 75 uh, species. But we need to go no further than this little spot where the star is. That's what it looks like today. But about um, 83 million years ago, as detected here, these are imagery that was taken when they were doing mineral exploration uh, in the Yulali area. It's called the Yulali Impact Crater. 
they found this disconformity in the superficial crust of the material. You can see here that something thin hit. Indeed, it was a very large meteorite hit. It was in the flat landscape, and you, instead of getting the whole uh, section being folded and uh, up, uplifted and um, filled with alluvial material, it was filled with dust-like material. And the importance of this was when they started drilling through in this area, straight through that, they got pores out from that um, uh, area that showed remarkable preservation of pollen deposits over an extremely long period of time. And I'm only going to show you the, the sort of three million year mark. It's the 67 to 90 meter segment. And this was work being done uh, by uh, John Dodson here at UWA. That's what those segments look like. You can see the laminations sitting in there. The black bits are little bits of micro charcoal material. And although you can't read these names across the top, the ebbs and flows that you see in the pollen show the ebbs and flows of species coming in and out of the system over um, this period of time, which is about a 350,000 year period of time. You can see systems were in a dynamic flux, but importantly, things just didn't vanish completely. They just sort of hung around, went into refugia, came back out, contracted again when the climate shifted and so on. What is remarkable about the Valley impact crater, though, when I looked at this, was if you walk in nearby systems to that, as you can see, um, this person walking through, you can see um, uh, kingers and so on, we can pick out a whole range of species, such as this isopodium, such as this ectodocolia, such as this stachousia, that were found in that um, deposit three million years ago. There is no other place on Earth where you can walk and look at flora and say, you've been hanging around in the neighborhood, annoying other species, for about three million years, because you've had such radical changes, often through the process of radical climate change and major, major glaciation, human impacts in some instances, but often mountain building and major shifts and submersion of, of continental shelves. And you lost species not so in the system. So when you walk in a set, an area like this, which is um, around the Mount Pasua area, you are walking on ancient hollow landscape where those species with the right engineering solution have been hanging around all thanks to great stability in the system. Now there were some people who came to this coast, and this was one of them, and I've used this uh, image uh, a couple of times before because I can hear people um, laughing because they know what's coming up. But there were some people who came to Western Australia, and this was Darwin. Um, this is an image of the, the Beagle Ross uh, Shardlow's wonderful uh, image of uh, uh, oils that he can do. This is actually the second journey of the Beagle, which didn't have uh, Darwin on. I might point out, by the time he visited Albany, he <coughs> had been suffering greatly. As we now know, he wasn't actually seasick, he was suffering from um, a mitochondrial malformation due to um, uh, a little bit of inbreeding in the Darwin family. <laughs> Didn't affect his thinking though. Um, but he was a very unhappy person. He arrived in summer, it was dry, there were lots of flies. He sort of walked around, he made dismissive comments in his diary about the settlers and the type of settlers that were in Albany <laughs> and decided that he'd never spent such a miserable and dull and uninteresting <laughs> time in Australia. So he never actually bothered to walk across the hill to a place called Lake Seppings, where the old used to get its early water. Had he walked there, he would have seen himself below as the old future plan. And he would have to the fact that here we had something unrelated to the tropical future plants, but doing the same thing. In that case, getting the engineering right by a process of convergent evolution. Had he also walked over there, he would have seen things such as honey possums, little marsupials, pollinating various plants, in this case, a very ancient group of plants, Dasupogans. He would have seen banksias and honeyeaters pollinating, and he would have seen in resplendent flower the world's largest mistletoe, the West Australian, uh, West Australian Christmas tree, had he bothered to walk over there. And I often think, had he done that, he would have also found some of the late flowering spider orchids, and I'm sure he would have got to concepts and origin of the species 
just a little, little bit earlier. <laughs> One thing that you did though say um, on that journey, this is 1836, he said, he, he did quote about what he saw as the impending doom for the Australian continent. He, he picked two animals, the emu, and he said the emu was banished a long distance and the kangaroo was becoming scarce. Now they, they haven't, they've flipped the other way because of the introduction, we think, of pasture grasses and cropping systems, but certainly um, with 18 mammal species now extinct, and uh, most recently in 2009, uh, the Bramble Key uh, mouse going extinct um, up in uh, the Torres Strait, are uh, certainly so going to remind us that this very old and venerable continent certainly needed to be treated with, with uh, far greater care. Now, had Darwin also, let's imagine he came back, and was able to go to UWA's wonderful reserve that I bet you none of you have been to at Mount Denia. Very few universities are blessed with such a wonderful area. It's um, about three kilometres by three kilometres square. Wonderful place. It has its own endemic gum tree. It has uh, uh, five nationally threatened plant species on it. And it has a wonderful ecosystem that's intact. And we have a number of study sites going up there where we're looking at the residuality of native soil sea bank because it is so pristine. But I really would have liked somebody like Darwin. We actually did manage to get David Attenborough up there and he thought it was fantastic, except for the ticks, he said. <laughs> <laughs> but I did something with them. I had a group of German students with me and they were saying, oh, we don't understand your plants, you know. Are there very many here? I said, okay, I will sit down in one spot. And so I sat down in one spot and I said, okay, within arm's length, I'm just going to see what I can collect. And I managed to collect 80 plant species. And this is some of those that I was able to collect, just reaching out. I said, now do you get the point? Because in Germany, to get 80 species, you have to walk a very long way um, to get that sort of number of plants. And when you look at these plants, as you'll see in a little while, they are, we have extraordinary diversity. We have more carnivorous plant species, 171 of the 100, uh, 195 species of sun juice of the whole planet occur just in the southwest of Western Australia. Darwin loved carnivorous plants. He wrote about them. He did incredible experiments. Um, his famous uh, um, meat experiments where he looked at the protein digestion. Had he been there, he would have seen extraordinary things happening, including uh, an entire group of insects that have learned to be teflon coated that live on the prey that's very kindly provided by the capture mechanisms, the sticky traps on the sun juice. Had he been there, he would have also seen the bird pollination that you see in this uh, uh, Darwinia speciosa and bird pollination in the legume. So it didn't matter where you came from in your ancestry as a plant species, you locked on to the available resources and Western Australian plants, all of these, do things in the most remarkable and different and unusual ways. So it means that we've been blessed with an extraordinary richness in the western part of the continent. This is a number from about three years ago. We suspect we're now nudging around the 8,000 mark. This is just for the southwest corner. Third described since 1970, so it shows that taxonomy is still vibrant in this state. We have upwards of eight endemic families. Now that easily rolls off the tongue, but you need to understand what that means. So all of Europe doesn't have a single plant family that they can call their own. North America doesn't have a single plant family uh, that they can call their own. But we go one step further, we have one almost endemic order. So you get species, genus, family, and then you go to order. That's the highest level. And we have one order. And that order is this remarkable thing. Um, the Dasypogonaceae in the Dasypogonaceae. This is Kinia, which is noteworthy, but there are about six different genera in this family, but they all sit in their own order. Now, had Victoria not had one outlier of that, they had a little tinsel order, they would have all been exclusively Western Australian, but I think we can say we're the only place, in the broad sense, that has a endemic order uh, of its own sort. 
to put that into context, there are no other endemic orders in a single place on Earth. So it's a unique attribute of the Southwest continent. And the sorts of plants that make up these endemic families are extraordinary. And, in, and I just had two colleagues over from the Royal Botanic Gardens, Q, and we're working on some of these really complex issues over why we have this. If you look at this thing, it grows in a few little patches uh, just up uh, off the Brand Highway near Canada. It's a thing called the Emblingia in the Emblinginaceae, Emblingia calciophora. And we've been working on the seed biology and the pollination ecology of this really oddball plant. It has only one species, as Aramisimaceae has only one species. Ectocolia, two genera, one species in each. Kephalotosi, one species. Why is this so? Well, you say, well, maybe these things evolved in quite recent time and they haven't learned to get away. Well, you've got to look at something like Kephalotosi, the Kephalotosi, and realise that it's been sitting in the southwest for around 30 million years. If you look at Ectocoliaceae here, this became really hot and topical property about five years ago when they discovered that embodied in Ectocolia, a little thing that very common in our northern sand plains, grows nowhere else in Australia, were the earliest ancestors of something we all eat most days, which are the cereals. So wheat, rice, oats and barley all have an ancestral origin embedded in the Ectocolia. So it's one of the oldest ancestors of the cereal family. So lots of people now hunting in this family to look at ancestral states, potentially to look at new genes in terms of plant breeding. <laughs> but you look at this as an example and you ask the question why, and we're now talking around the 60 million year mark, why for 60 million years did this plant live in the southwest and never bother to go anywhere else? We've certainly got evidence of plants coming here in recent times. We've got dates of around 80,000 years of certain lilies coming from South Africa. We suspect rafting. We have the enigmatic situation of it's not my graphics, but this is a boa nut from Malcolm McKinley from our sole um, um, baobab or boab tree, Adamsonia, Gregori. And the enigmatic thing with this is that this is actually quite a recent arrival. This is about five to six million year mark. Some people are suggesting probably a million to a million and a half years. Potentially, it could have been in other parts, gone extinct, and was brought to Australia as food in early humanoid or human uh, contacts with Australia. We don't know. But certain plants have come our way, but why didn't anything ever get out? And why, for example, all of these didn't bother to go to eastern Australia? And we've got lots of evidence of plants migrating around the planet. You just have to look at the weeds that we have. Um, that move with animals to know that plants do move. And it's not that they have a peculiar seed biology. We've now done lots of work on the ability of these seeds to survive and live in soil seed banks and to live for long periods of time, and they all have incredible capacity for survival. There's something that um, we are still working on to try and work out what kept them at home. Now, maybe Emirates wasn't flying at that time of the year, um, we don't know, but it's certainly an intriguing and complex issue and our colleagues at Kew are working on what is uh, probably one of the great, um, to borrow Darwin's phrase, one of the great abominable mysteries of why we have blessed so many. Now in terms of the, the systems and the processes that operate in southwest flora to diversify, there are, there are some obvious opportunities that, that come to light. One of those is the pollination mechanism. Now this is uh, from uh, 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 Bjorn Borman, he's a colleague, he works at ANU, uh, we, we did a, uh, with Rod Pickle, who's a former BWA graduate, we, we've been working uh, feverishly on trying to understand uh, pollination syndromes as diversification factors in plants. And one of those uh, intriguing areas that we've been working on uh, to try and understand why do we still pack more species into Western Australia and, and the Southwest America was to look at certain anomalous forms of pollination syndromes. Because if you can uh, latch onto a, a new pollinator, you can then diversify and retain a particular lineage. So they've just done this review, which is just coming out, um, of sexual deception. And um, 
we were interested in where sexual deception occurs around the world. Um, interestingly, South Africa have a daisy that engages in. This is where plants deceive through the use of scent and visual cues of the female of the, of the same species. So they have daisy. Um, eight years ago, a colleague in South America found um, the genus of the panthes. These are micro orchids that grow all the way up tree trunks or through South America, particularly in the, in the high Andean rainforest that they were attracting a whole range of different gnats and wasps, um, and this is the genus Corea and down in Argentina, um, that again was using sexual deception. Darwin, of course, wrote about the various contrivances by which organs are pollinated by insects, and wrote eloquently about the sexual deception system that was happening in European bee orchids. This is the genus Ophrys, but it's been found in other orchids and indeed in iris. Um, in the eastern Mediterranean. But when you come to Australia, and you come to Western Australia in particular, that's when sexual deception essentially goes crazy. You find um, it restricted to the orchids, but the orchids have done this to a level of perfection almost unheard of. And what this review is about is about the chemistry that drives the diversification. Because we've now been able to synthesize the chemicals from um, these, these orchids here, the, the hammer orchids and from the spider orchids, we can put them on nothing more than a little black plastic mat bead, take it out into bushland, and the male wasp will try to fly off with the plastic napkin, believing that it's a true female. So either it's a typical dumb male response, <laughs> or that the visual um, imagery is not as important as the general shape and the general use of the chemical cues. And what we've found in the work that we've done over the last eight years with a number of fantastic uh, colleagues, PhD students, is that the diversification of our southwest orchids has skyrocketed to the degree where we've got almost a hundred different species use various levels of sexual deception. And they can use it in flamboyant spider orchids through to um, a species you'll see in my moment, <coughs> all the way through to our latest discovery, which is this one, the um, big um, uh, green crawl of South West Western Australia. Now, this is the hammer orchid, and I do apologise for the um, That's the hammer orchid. That's the flightless female. She climbs up on a little piece of stick just above the soil. She releases a pheromone, and the orchid releases exactly the same design of pheromone. He attempts to mate with the labellum. The labellum has a special elastic hinge and gets catapulted into that structure. In the flying duck orchid, and that's the only footage ever taken, it uses both a chemical cue, a tactile cue, and holds the, the, the wasp in that position to affect pollination. So each of these orchids is using a particular design of chemical. And they work in particular groups. Um, the pyrazines are one of the big groups. And the way each of these orchids has speciated in the southwest of Western Australia, um, the four groups that we've worked on, has been they get a basic bit of chemical architecture and they just, just keep changing parts of the chemical and keep experimenting until it locks on to a particular male wasp that will respond. And the way orchids do this is they produce vast numbers of seeds. So there's no doubt lots of failures in the system, but there are successes in the system as they go along. And as a result of this, we have this diversification on a scale that's almost unparalleled. But what's been really exciting, and this was a wonderful um, uh, uh, postdoc student that we had come to Western Australia, and she's, she's now here, she's doing uh, um, further work on pollination in donkey orchids, and that's Kings Park, that's the lab, and she came along and she's very passionate, she's from Northern Italy, she works on bees, and she said, I like orchids, I want to do something on pollination. I said, well, you're here in the winter, there's not a lot of flowers. I said, but there's these greenwood orchids, they grow out the front of the building, we don't know what pollinates them. I think it's fungus gnats, and I think it's just, um, it's, it was considered that these fungus gnats were looking for a uh, food site for the land of eggs, because they're the ones that labor these and those little mushroom bodies. So we did the work, 
we found fungus gnats indeed did have the pollen. They, this is the orchid that they were pollinated on. It has a very touch sensitive lip there. But what we hadn't realised is, and this is an interesting example of someone, everyone who had ever found one of these fungus gnats did the one thing that all good scientists should do. They should have sexed the fungus gnat. Every fungus gnat was a male, not a female. So if it was looking for a spot to lay its eggs, <laughs> That's what we started to think about. Just maybe we would have the extraordinary situation of a fungus gnat being sexually attracted to this big brown flower. So Daniela, in her inimitable way, then decided to sit and wait and wait and wait with a video camera and she caught this footage. And there you see the male probing the lip. The lip is touch sensitive. And that little wasp is <laughs> up there, and you can see him inside the gale, and this is the foot of the orchid, and is eventually released out the front with a little dusting of pollen, and the system works so elegantly. We get 100% of these pollinated by that system. This was the first time that fungus gnats had been shown to be involved in the sexual reception system. What I was intrigued with was that little touch sensitive mechanism has to know the weight of a fungus snap. Have you ever played a fungus snap? <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're, they're about um, a, a nanogram in weight, so they're really light, but that's enough weight for that little bit to pick up. And each of our particular species of green hooks, and we have five species in King's Park, all use their own particular sexual deceit fungus snap. A beautiful example of how you key into the right pollinator and you can certainly get the system to work very well. So pollination is one of the parts of the story um, that works well. The other part of the story is nothing to do with pollination and it's not about diversification. It's about sitting around and just getting everything right ecologically. This is one of the plants that in my little Rika Erickson book, Sitting Under My Pillow, I was determined one day I would work on this, the Western Australian underground orchid. It finished flowering back in June in the central wheat belt. It grows in association with this uh, broom honey metal. Uh, this is the co-author of the Orchids of Western Australia book that UWA Press or publishing uh, published. And this was our one of our rediscovery sites um, that we found in the town of Babakan. And it's this large purple tulip structure. Um, this was found um, in the wheat belt around 1928 by farmer Jack Trot. He was a bit of an inventor and all of the orchids that were discovered by him and other farmers around that time were all during the process um, euphemistically called new land clearing. And um, they were clearing the land for cereal farming. They loved to go into the broom honeybush country and um, that was the country where they kept turning up these white flowers. It caused an absolute hit around the world that found down under in Western Australia was an orchid that lived totally underground. It had no leaves, it had no roots, it had no green parts. It had in fact consigned itself to living in this troglodytic environment deep in the soils of the wheat belt of Western Australia. So enamoured were people, a wax model was made, it was uh, created around here and then went around all the horticultural circuits at that time and caused a great hit. But the issue was that every discovery, of course, was the extinction of that species because it always found when the plant was turning, turning up new soil. And so um, in my journey through the flora, um, I remember seeing uh, uh, or having the then Paul Witchley, who was the director of King's Park, calling up and saying, we've got some money from WWF for a little postdoc um, on the underground orchid. Do you think you would be interested? <laughs> and um, I just finished my PhD with John Payton. Of course, I was over the moon. And he said, but we'll have to interview you. So he interviewed me. And there was the panel up in the Kings Park Board office, the uh, Hello Rooms. And I got there all very enthusiastic and green from and uh, so the first question was, so, so Dr. Dixon, how would you go looking for an underground orchid? <laughs> of course, I hadn't even thought through 
it's not a grand orchid, so you can make sure you know where it's growing. And uh, I remembered uh, lectures by the, um, a wonderful mycologist, Roger Hilton, about truffle forks that they used to use, and I just made it up on the run. I said, oh, I've used truffle forks. They used to the truffles. Oh, a very good answer. <laughs> and so off we went, and we went off into the wheat belt. We discovered it um, following the rediscovery. Um, down London up, we were able to use some of the location uh, information around species that have lived with, to then work in the central wheat belt, which was the hub of where it had been discovered, and we found it at the town of Babington, and we were able to capture all sorts of things. A bit hard to see, but they were images that I took of the world's only termite pollinated plant. Of course, it's the only water pollinated by the termite as well. Um, and makes good sense. It's also able to use fungus snacks when it wants to take pollen further away through little cracks in the soil. It produces little fleshy capsules that you can see here. The fleshy, cap fleshy capsules have the largest seeds known in the orchid world. And we were suspicious. Fleshy capsules are rare. Large seeds are rare in the orchids. We <coughs> wonder whether extinct marsupials, that are extinct in that area, may in fact, fossorial marsupials, may have dug these up. And so with the then zoology department who had uh, some of these small uh, marsupials, we did some feeding experiments and indeed these very faint odour we could detect in capsules that we hid in their little pens, they dug them up, they ate them, and we were able to extract intact seeds from the droppings uh, of those sniff boxes, which was terrifically exciting but also very depressing because we'd already done full screening of those habitats in the wheat belt to show they have long since been extinct in those environments. And these are some of the casualties of that large scale clearing and of course predators such as feral cats. <coughs> Undaunted by that, we then took those seeds. We were suspicious that the broom honey myrtle was the host plant, since this is a non-green plant that needed to get its carbon from somewhere. We got the fungus out, we were able to put the fungus onto those root systems, and these are baby uh, underground orchid plants growing, and we're able to get first flowering in pot. Of the material and showing that indeed this orchid is beautifully matched to an environment with great stability through the agency of the fungus and as long as that stability is there the orchid is fine. Make the environment stable and the system collapses completely. The sort of sad epilogue to this whole journey was although we found um, almost 180 plants back in uh, 1980 in that central wheat belt population we've now declined due to the ravages of the drying of the wheat belt, weed incursions, we're now down to just six plants left of that species in the snapdrop mm -hmm. habitat. And um, big work to do there in repatriating those up and in the future. But what an incredible species. Now the Eastern States also in 1930 discovered their own underground orchid at a place called Bulladilla, north of New South Wales. It actually has green parts it sits in the forest soil and it lives in rainforest. And so we then were, uh, we started piecing together the history of this then. In fact, it's a rainforest refugee who, instead of coming up above ground and trying to survive in the exigencies of a changing climate and drying climate, all it did was go underground, stay there, and learn to use a fungus on the root system of the new plant. The fungus it uses, although it's unique in this association, is a fungus that we do find in other systems, uh, particularly in cross systems. So that was the clever little bit of trickery that this all could use to survive very nicely in this environment. <laughs> so anyway, to conclude with, he, he was my hero and really got interested in the science. But I don't know how much of a good science, a scientist he was, but we must look at his H index or one of these publishers and things. But, um, the question is, though, that we still have an extraordinary diversity where we don't necessarily have pollination systems, we don't necessarily have anomalous systems of nutrition. And if this is the work that's been led by Hans Landers and the whole team of the School of Plant Biology here, and all of us have been moving in this same journey towards the same sort of conclusion, sort of in a parallel universe that we've been working in, that Maybe the great drivers of diversification have been the great stability, the highly infertile soils, and indeed the whole system operates as if a coral, like a coral without water. 
That is, you leave things alone, you drop the nutrients, and it's the reverse of the agrarian mentality that we come with, that you add nutrients to get productivity, but you add nutrients, you don't necessarily get diversity. And so what I'm going to finish off with is, uh, it's two minutes, it's from Hans Landers and the School of Pathology's Pongan uh, website. It's a snapshot of what is extraordinarily condensed, focused science. But when you look at this, and do go to the Pongan website, give them money as well, <laughs> um, and, and you walk in West Australian bushland, what you will hear and see in the next couple of minutes is potentially the way, whether it's Kings Park Bushland, whether it's the wonderful forest up in John Forest or the Mount Lassua National Park or the Stirling, these are probably what we think are the basic driving forces that have given us an extraordinarily rich and diverse flora in the south of Western Australia, but also the extraordinary vulnerabilities of those. So I'll just conclude with this to remind us that this has uh, been a lecture about journeys. This is, again, Australia travelling north, taking with it an extraordinarily rich capsule of experimental material that's become some of the most remarkable plant material for all of us to research. And I look forward, particularly in the new molecular age, that's just opening our eyes to wonderful new opportunities that we will see even greater stories and more in, uh, incredible dramas being played out in Southwest Florida. So with that, with enormous apologies for complete technological failure, <laughs> um, I'm happy to take any questions. Oh, thank you.